The creative economy, or the orange economy as it's called, is an important cornerstone in our world. Wherever you go, people are finding creative ways in the arts to make a living. During the 21st century, we saw a shift from traditional industries like energy and manufacturing to more interest being paid to digital technology and new media. As these trends continue, it is very likely that greater reliance will continue to be placed in cultural and creative industries. Officials in Barbados believe that in order for Barbados to remain relevant and competitive, we must continue to develop the creative economy. It is a way of looking at things that we never thought had value and placing value on them and creating an atmosphere where those persons with new ideas, um, new thoughts about certain things can now expand that to have some sort of commerce attached to it. So your cuisine, that can be a part of your cultural industry, your jellies and jams, your, your national dish. It's all a matter of how you find those things, art, um, what, what we call culture, and again, attaching an economic value to it and making it into business. Like all industries, there is a need for investment for the industry to develop and grow. When you talk about the cultural industries, you're really talking about an investment in people. Do you understand? Your creatives are people. Um, cultural industries does not happen in a vacuum. We are talking about people who bring their ideas and their skills to the forefront. So you need to invest in your people. And for the mere fact that we are not tapping into the amount of economic activity that we should at this particular point in, in, in time. Uh, it is imperative that every income stream that we can create, uh, you have to invest in it. And for years I've been one of those people who's been advocating that we need to look at the cultural industries in a different way. We need to look at it as business, the same way that we look at tourism, same way that we look at manufacturing. We have to look at what we have to offer, our fashion, our designs, our clothes, what, whatever it is. We have to look at it as business and put the best minds around it to do the marketing, to do the research, to find new markets, to put it as things to trade as humanly possible. For the private sector, though, they have to see the cultural industries, quote unquote, as part and parcel of our ability to support each other to get to a common goal, uh, to a common end. Let's get real. Business is about making money. And so you would see that fashion, things like alcohol, and these things cross over and over. So therefore, if you have iconic people, like look at Rihanna, for instance, you can see the amount of things that she has been able to get herself to involve with fashion, um, makeup, all of these different things. And I'm saying that we can start in our own way here, taking some of the icons, not only in terms of sponsorship and, and stuff like that, but, but creating new products and services around the cultural industries. And again, you're looking for things to export. So you can imagine, I'll give you a simple example. Suppose it's rum. I wouldn't call any particular name, but it's rum that you're going to export. If you attach to your export rum, music, a CD of, of, of the best of crop over, video, video or whatever it is, even though these things are going out, but, but, but whatever. The, the point is that you can see where the one can piggyback on the other. And so you might be able now to get rum to a whole new market of people who are pretty interested in music and vice versa. And so these are the synergies that you need to, you need to, to understand in the name of, of creating new avenues for your businesses and work together. As a former artist, Minister King has had a personal experience in the entertainment industry. He believes that all players involved should be committed and passionate. 
We've got to create a, a complete new atmosphere within the ministry. Because if we are going to be talking about the creative industries, we talk about the cultural industries, then we must be passionate about what we do. It cannot be that this is just a job that we come to every five days and that's it. If you look at the models that are used around the world for successful um, cultural industry um, businesses such as Walt Disney and these other things like that, they have specific guidelines of the type of personalities that they employ to be involved in the thing. So let's, let's, let's get real. How can you write a story that is geared towards children and you have no imagination? It's not going to work. And so we must reach the stage where, as the ministry itself, we must be the flag bearers. We must be the passion behind the culture and culture industries. When I come to this job, that same passion that I just spoke to you about, that is what I come to it with. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna say this on camera and people might not even believe it, but the point is that even if you didn't pay me and I had to come here to do this, I would be passionate about it because I know and not I think, but I actually know what it feels like to be a young person and not have the infrastructure around that you can excel in something that you love, such as art, such as, as we I go back to the word, cultural industries. I know what that feels like. So I know the obstacles that I myself had to go through for many years. And I'm here to ensure that the next generation of artists, the next generation of, of, of cuisine persons and other things like that have much more opportunities. The Crop Over Festival must be seen as more than a party, but rather should be respected for the opportunities it presents to artists, promoters, stage managers, and everyone involved in the business. Crop Over. For me, <laughs> we've been saying this for years, it's more than a carnival. It is an expression of who we are. It is a celebration of who we are. It is also a vision of who we can be for the rest of the world. When you see our creative people at work, our musicians, our singers, our songwriters, our mass makers, um, the people, our promoters and producers, these people, they're all creative people. Even the persons who have stalls, your vendors and whatever, they're all creative people. One of the things that we first have to do is to understand that crop over is not the fact. Crop over is not, as you say, the walking up. It is not the drinks. Crop over is people. Crop over is an expression. Crop over is who you are. And so once you begin to view it in a complete different light, then you're more invested in being able to go out to effect, to go out and have a good time, to contribute to making sure that our top artists are well paid, that they continue to make great music, that our literary people who bring out books and whatever else around that time can find a space where we celebrate them. And it has to expand. What we have done is condensed it to being a carnival and I'm saying that the time has come when we must first and foremost see crop over as a time when we express ourselves, but we express that which is excellent. Can we take it from the top of the foundry scene? Actress Alison Silly Smith's passion for acting began in the 60s when she was in primary school. In secondary school, as a consequence of being a Barbados scholar, she was pushed towards academia, but after receiving a bachelor's degree in psychology and French, she moved to Toronto to pursue her true passion, the theatre. After working in theatre and film for over 30 years, she returned to Barbados and took up a post with the NCF. First as Senior Business Development Officer and then as Consultant, yeah, so Festivals and Events. Creative economy to me is about ideas. I'm really excited about the idea of a creative economy. There is no right way to do it. There is no opinion that is more valid than anybody else's. Everybody has an agenda. I have one. 
And my agenda is to do whatever I possibly can to ensure that more people can make a living doing what they love and are good at. Right now, one of the things that I think that we, we need to be doing is we need a national performing arts company. We need a national performing arts company as part of this, one of the components of this creative economy. There's got to be somewhere for the performing artists to go because we're not, the performing artists are not the same as the people in the entertainment field. Arts and entertainment are slightly different things. So yes, and, and some of the onus of what we have to do, some of it is government, some of it has to be, has to be policy driven, and that policy has got to be um, um, backed up by a certain amount of public investment based on long-term not uh, long-term goals, not just short-term um, uh, revenues. There is a need for the industry to evolve and continue to grow if it is to be taken seriously. If we're going to grow this creative economy, we got to get rid of this hobbyist idea. We have to be really, really, we have to allow space for professionals. There is no real industrialization without professionalization. And so that's one of my arguments for a performing arts company as well. But that works across all kinds of, of areas. You just can't do it. I mean, yes, you have to have people who of course are doing it because they love it and they will come out and they will be in the, the play and they will work during the day because they don't want to give up their day job to go and do this. But you also need a, a cadre of people that this is what they do. To get good at what you do, you got to do it. You can't be working nowhere else and do it. I mean, you can if you want to stay here, but a creative economy means that, I mean, our market is so small, we have to export, right? You want to get serious and you want to, you want to go on a tour and you want to be doing um, a, a wonderful production where people just are not watching you because you're exotic and you have cute little accents and cute little dances, but because you are excellent. Yes, you're telling a story that they haven't heard before, but you can compete with anybody. You don't do that on a part-time basis. Hello, my name is Terry Arthur. Uh, everyone knows me as Mexican. Uh, I've been playing music from the time I was like nine years old, professionally. I used to play in a steel band um, in Brazil. Um, started at nine years old. You know, we would play at all the hotels and festivals, in Oisin's Fish Festival, Old Town Festival. And then uh, I played until I was like uh, 15, 16 in that band. I also was the leader of the Lodge School Band, when I was at Lodge. And then I went on cruise ships. I was working on cruise ships for like seven, eight years, you know, just traveling the world playing. And then I came back and I joined the band Square One. And I was the musical director for the band. Also songwriter, uh, writing songs for Alison Hans, songs like uh, Ragamuffin, which was her first road march song. I, 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 Bazadi, and Togetherness, uh, produced for Luma. So I did a lot of work um, and which took me all over the world. And playing music, especially on a cruise ship, is very lucrative. You know, I, made, I was able to make a career, decide that I could make a, a solid career from playing music. Um, and then playing with Square One, we got really popular. You know, we would be touring every weekend, sometimes twice, three times a week. You know. And then from writing songs to as a songwriter, we have royalties, which you know, we get every quarter. So I was able to make a, a lucrative career from playing music. After Square One, I started to play solo steel pan, you know, with accompaniment uh, tracks or something that really occur just on the guitar. And, you know, I would still be playing in hotels and stuff. But then I got a call from a friend, um, Chantel Lynch, from this school, uh, Irving Wilson, to just come and probably do a one class, you know, just for fun. And I did it and I loved it. And it was like, well, I can't see how I could stop, no. So I've been, I think this is, this will be my second year. Um, and we've done all kinds of shows. We played for the Governor General. That was my first um, performance with the school band. And it was amazing for me because we had children who were deaf, uh, hearing impaired, visually impaired, autistic, blind. And they just loved the music. And we would go and play. And they just kept doing it. So now I try to do it like once every week. And then during the camp, 
you know, um, I just would come and still, still do music because I realized the children like, like music. My name is Olivia Hall. In a nutshell, Olivia Hall first is a dance drama creative, um, choreographer, dance teacher, artistic director, movement director, performing artist, in that order. What led me to dance, I believe, was the first time I did a dance production at the age of 16 or 17, that was at church. And um, from there, I just couldn't stop. I became infatuated with the art. And I, it became my root, my foundation of my being. And since then till now, I've not stopped. I, I knew that I wanted to teach, but I didn't know what exactly. I always found it cool um, to have kids around and pretend that I would, my mother would tell me about this, I would pretend that I'm teaching to a classroom, etc. But dance, I believe, really was inspired from church and the community in church. Um, young ladies coming together, creating dances, but at the end of the day, somebody had to take charge. So all of a sudden it would be Livy taking charge and it just went from there. So honestly, after the first dance production, I felt like, oh, I think I want to study this. I think I want to know more about dance. Um, and not even performing, um, perform in the performing area, but more choreographing, putting, putting the dance moves together and, and then just seeing what a choreography would look like on stage, on people, and more importantly, how that would make other people feel. They knew from very early that it was music, that I was going to be a musician, because you know, I would be five, six years old, just beating on the tables, and they just knew. So it wasn't any surprise when I told them that I was going to be a musician. My family and friends have been very supportive in the pursuit of dance. Well, all my goals, anything that I set my mind to, um, they're always quote unquote backing me. There was a point in, in my life that I felt like if, I started to question if dance is truly it, is it truly my calling? And I started to decide, do I need an extra job or do I need to do dance and something else? Um, but no, I, I, I didn't like the feeling of being trapped. I used that feeling as a driving force to be unstoppable and be, be more focused on my passion, which was you know what, this is technically your birthright. You were born to be a creative, you were born to be in performing arts, focus on dance, focus on teaching, and just try to live your passion. I was very fortunate. I, was, I would say my career, I have been very fortunate. When I went out on the cruise ships, I didn't have any challenges, you know. Um, then when I came and joined Square One, that whole time in Square One, it was just smooth sailing. Because of the sounds, you know, we had, we quickly got hit sounds. And once you have hit sounds, people call you, they want you to come and perform. Can you climb a mountain in one day? <laughs> you can't. But um, anything that you set out to do will always have difficulties. And what I find you, you should always remember you should always remember to see how you're gonna manage it or see how you're gonna approach it and try to manage it the best as you can, your way. So yeah, and, and don't get frustrated. Have patience with yourself and have faith in your journey for sure. Always be your authentic self because no one is you. Everybody's like, oh, this person does that too, but no, nobody's you. You you are your own self and no one can take away that power from you. I usually tell people like, you know, make sure that they're sure 
that is music that they want to do. I don't, because it's, you know, you could be popular or you could get a hit song or you may not get a hit song. And then if you don't have anything really to fall back on, then they, you know. So I tell them just make sure and put the all into it, whatever they decide to do. And, you know, usually whatever you put in, you will get back. There is no doubt that Barbados can benefit significantly from the development of the creative economy. But in order for it to reach its full potential, significant work needs to be done to further develop, drive and push this industry. I'm a creative and I'm passionate about the intricacies of art and the way it makes people feel. Life always inspires me to continue what I was born to do. It's my birthright. Life is an inspiration with so many topics and experiences to explore. So that's what drives me to be better, to grow, and continue what I was chosen to do. You can find more government information by visiting our website, gisbarbados.gov.bb. Like and follow us on these social media platforms under the handle GIS Barbados and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The BGIS.